would like to welcome you to this webinar presented by Macro International's Litigation Practice Group. My name is Paul Habern. I'm with Mahaffey Weber in Houston, Texas, and I coordinate the efforts of Macro International's practice groups. Today, we have experts from Macro International's member firms to discuss various aspects of infrastructure projects. Before I give you their introductions, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Macro International. Celebrating its 30th year, Macro International is a worldwide network of law firms. We currently have over 4,500 lawyers in 60 countries on five continents. Through Macro's breadth and depth of experience, our member firms can assist clients in handling most any issue anywhere in the world. Our first presenter is Kevin Quinn, who will discuss public-private partnerships. Brad Sugarman and Patty Power will next discuss President Trump's infrastructure plan. David Wilson will follow to discuss damages caused by delay. And Greg Bergman will conclude with risk and insurance issues. Before we get started, on your screen, there should be a question box. If you do not see the question box, please click on the red arrow and that will get you a question box. If you have any questions during our presentation, please type them in the box and we will answer them after our presentation. Finally, for those seeking CLE accreditation for attending, we have been approved for this live broadcast in California, Indiana, Nevada, and Texas. Our first presenter is Kevin Quinn. Kevin is a partner at Bose McKinney and Evans, practicing in the areas of business and commercial construction and civil litigation. Mr. Quinn has represented clients in a variety of disputes, including complex business litigation and construction disputes concerning major public works projects. He is a frequent volunteer in local politics and is licensed to practice in Indiana, the Indiana Supreme Court, United States District Court for the District of Indiana, the United States District Court for the Southern District of Indiana. Mr. Quinn earned his law degree from Indiana University Law School. And Kevin, I see you have the screen and may proceed. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and good afternoon, participants. And good morning to our West Coast participants. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about public-private partnerships and their utility on, on infrastructure projects. And before we get going here uh, too, too in-depth into in my uh, subject matter, I wanted to take a quick look at um, the state of infrastructure in America. And the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, issues a report card uh, for the infrastructure in America uh, from time to time. And uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen uh, some really poor grades when it comes to grading uh, the infrastructure in America. And the most recent overall grade uh, from 2017 gave America's infrastructure a D plus. Uh, and the ASCE, uh, provides an estimate for the cost of making improvements to that infrastructure over uh, the next 10 years, and they set the price tag at $4.59 trillion. So it's obviously, obviously going to be a very costly endeavor to, to improve on uh, the infrastructure in the United States. Taking uh, just one component of the infrastructure and taking a closer look at it, uh, let's look at America's bridges. And on the left side of your of your screen, you'll see uh, the age of America's bridges, and roughly 40% of the bridges in the United States um, are, are over uh, 50 years old, excuse me, and more than half are over 40 years old. So obviously we've got some, some aging and decrepit um, um, infrastructure components. On the right hand of your, of your screen, you'll see some uh, structurally deficient bridges in terms of um, both the, by number and by percentage. Uh, so if you find your state among those, those groups at the bottom of the screen, um, contact your local legislator. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, infrastructure is, is really one of those few issues in today's uh, political climate that crosses over the traditional party lines and that, that everybody can agree that something needs to be done about it. Uh, however, despite that political will, we are often met with political reality, uh, and, and that comes in terms of paying for all of this, for all the improvements that are necessary. And that is uh, particularly uh, an issue because of the increasing burden that's placed on, on local and state governments. But public-private partnerships are just one avenue for, for potentially addressing those, those needs for infrastructure improvements. Just a little bit of background on, on P3s, as they're commonly called. Uh, they were developed primarily in Europe, Canada, Asia, and Australia. 
and they were uh, developed as a kind of an innovative way to to meet the public's needs uh, through through government efforts. And that longer history in those other countries and other jurisdictions provide um, us in, in the United States with an opportunity to, to, to look at how those projects have unfolded and to determine what really works and what may not work uh, in the United States and, and its relative infancy when it comes to P3s. And these P3 projects can be, can be found in a number of areas. Uh, you know, anything from, from diplomacy or social policy when it comes to, to foreign aid measures, um, or even, you know, more commonly, and, and as we probably conceptualize them most frequently, with regard to public works projects. And in the United States, we're starting to see their application beyond just, uh, you know, in the transportation realm. And we see them um, employed to, to address broadband network needs, wastewater projects, uh, campus housing issues. Uh, uh, Developments and civic gathering spaces, uh, and, and much and much more. Today's focus, obviously, is going to be on infrastructure, and uh, because there's not a, a, a single definition that can meet the needs of these diverse uh, uh, applications of the P3 model. Uh, I looked to the Department of Transportation and found a definition that that is is pretty good. Um, P3s are contractual agreements formed between a public agency and a private sector entity that allow for greater private sector participation in the delivery and financing of transportation projects. And this participation typically involves uh, the private sector taking on a greater share of, of the risks in terms of design and finance, uh, the long-term operation of the, of the project or the facility, um, the maintenance over the life cycle of that, that contract, and then uh, potentially for uh, the traffic revenue and handling, handling those issues. And P3s are, are obviously taken uh, for, for a number of reasons, and it's not just the, the construction of a new project. We often see it uh, done to monetize um, existing assets, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. These are some of the questions we're hoping to address today. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the applications of the P3 model. Um, we'll talk about why they're increasingly used uh, on infrastructure projects. Then we'll try to identify some of the challenges that P3 projects face, and then some of the uh, innovations and evolutions of the P3 uh, model um, and how they meet those challenges. Looking at uh, the general application of P3s on infrastructure, we'll start off by talking about uh, new build facilities. So this is where the, the, there's construction of a new asset or there's some sort of, of upgrade of an existing facility, uh, maybe some, uh, some expansion of it. Um, but regardless of, of whether it's a, it's a new construction from the ground up or it's, it's just uh, making modifications to an existing uh, facility, the public entity will always maintain ownership of that facility, but it transfers um, a lot of the risk and the responsibilities over um, for the design, the construction, uh, the financing, operation, maintenance um, over, over the lifetime of that contract. And these con contractual periods are typically uh, very lengthy. You know, we'll see 50, 75 years in some instances. Um, and all throughout that life cycle, there, that private entity is going to be um, partnering with the government to deliver services. The private entity will receive revenue from tolls or fees um, or rate payers um, and sometimes and increasingly um, from regular payments um, or, or availability payments as they're sometimes referred to from the public sector uh, over time. And I've listed a few common examples there. You'll see toll roads, bridges, tunnels, transit projects. These are the types of things that we commonly think of with, when we uh, discuss P3s. As I mentioned before, though, uh, there are also an application for P3s uh, with regard to existing facilities. Um, so in these, in these scenarios, that's where uh, the, the public entity may lease uh, an existing asset, for instance, a toll road, over to a private sector partner who can then uh, operate the facility over the lifetime of the contract. 
typically under these these um, uh, models, the private partner will pay a concession fee up front, uh, and these can be rather substantial in size. Then the private partner, as I mentioned, operates and maintains over the life cycle. Again, this is, is seen in toll roads uh, and bridges. So what is it about uh, the P3 project model um, that is so appealing? You know, the, the first thing that, that most people think about is the financing on the front end. Um, the, the private entity comes in and assumes a lot of the responsibility for paying for the project, the improvements um, or the new construction um, at the outset. And obviously that's a very important factor. But there are financial uh, benefits to be had uh, well after that initial outlay of, of funds. And uh, this can come in the form of, of you know, providing operational staffing uh, or ma maintenance and uh, repairs over the lifetime of that, of that um, uh, facility. And over, the, over time, a private partner may receive uh, you know, recurring streams of revenue um, or in some instances kind of that recurring um, availability payment um, from time to time. Some additional benefits of P3s uh, can come in terms of meeting cost and schedule objectives. There was a study uh, recently by Syracuse University that concluded that there was a higher likelihood of meeting those cost and scheduling obligations um, on P3 projects. So obviously there's some benefit there. Another uh, a key benefit is the fact that the private sector partner can bring its expertise to bear on the project. A lot of times uh, uh, the public sector may not be able to keep up with the latest innovations or the latest trends, and this provides them an opportunity to tap into resources, expertise uh, from the public sector. So what's the hesitation? Why, why with all these benefits are there um, still jurisdictions that are reluctant to, to jump uh, feet first into the P3 pr project model. A lot of it may be uh, just the, you know, kind of the fear of the unknown. Uh, some public entities may not be familiar with this project delivery method and may not want um, to, to jump into it. So in other, uh, so there's got to be some level of comfort that comes along with that. Um, and that may just come with time and, and getting engaged in these projects um, more and more. Some public entities may just be uh, reluctant to relinquish control over those valuable assets. Um, other times they may just be a little short-sighted. Uh, they may just see that, you know, the construction of a toll road and the imposition of, of tolls at the outset, uh, a new imposition of tolls, that may be a, a little jarring um, to uh, the public official and they'll have, uh, you know, some difficulty explaining that to their constituency um, and using, using just that uh, initial imposition of a fee or, or a, a toll um, really does a disservice to the public because there may be greater uh, savings over the lifetime of that, that contract. Um, so you want to take a look at those long-term advantages, you know, in terms of maintenance and operations. There also may be times when uh, there may be a decline in usage um, with regard to a, a toll road. And so that public, or excuse me, the private partner may not be uh, receiving the revenues that it had projected at the outset when the contract was entered, and they may run into some financial difficulties down the road. So those are some of the reasons that there may be some hesitation uh, when entering into a P3 uh, model. Despite those concerns, though, we're seeing uh, really a broad uh, uh, recognition and acceptance of the P3 model in America. As of 2016, 33 states plus uh, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico had enacted legislation that enables uh, P3s uh, for transportation projects. And even in those jurisdictions where there may not be enabling legislation yet, um, some of those, those uh, assemblies, general assemblies and what have you, have at least discussed or explored uh, the P3 model. I want to turn just briefly to a couple of um, legal issues that may come up with regard to P3s, or at least a couple of unique ones that, that I found 
um, and doing some research. Some of our, our colleagues and the other presenters uh, later today may discuss um, some other uh, issues with P3 projects and uh, overcoming those legal challenges. Um, but today I just wanted to focus on a couple. The first is, is with regard to a, a case in Indiana. Um, there was a, a set of plaintiffs that challenged the constitutionality of that enabling legislation um, because they believed it was special legislation that was prohibited by the Indiana State Constitution because it, it benefited only a handful of counties through which uh, the toll road, the Indiana toll road ran. Um, so the, the court examined whether it was special legislation or general legislation and ultimately they found that, that just because uh, a handful of counties were benefiting um, from lump sum payments, uh, it, it wasn't special legislation because there was also some funds uh, that, were, that were dispersed throughout the state. But the court went on to conclude, in addition, that the General Assembly has the power uh, to make appropriations. And so there was a, a firm recognition of the separation of powers and the importance of that doctrine. Another pretty unique um, challenge that I found was was in California where there was a union of government engineers uh, who challenged the validity of the, the P3 um, of a P3 usage uh, on the construction of the Presidio Parkway project in the San Francisco area. The union there was was fearing that they were going to lose their jobs, um, that there was going to be a reduction in the benefits, and then that over time there may be some increase in cost to, to taxpayers at large. And they made a number of statutory interpretation arguments, uh, all of which the, the, the court ultimately rejected, um, and, and they, they then issued a dismissal of the case. The reason I wanted to bring this case up in particular was to, to highlight that, uh, more importantly than some of the legal challenges or the, the statutory uh, interpretation arguments that were raised in the case, I think the, the broader takeaway is that there may be times when um, you're going to see some resistance, particularly in areas and jurisdictions where there's a strong labor movement um, or organized labor um, uh, capacity, that, that there may be some pushback. Um, and so it's important for the government units to uh, recognize that and try to engage those, uh, those members of their constituency and to try and address their concerns. And maybe that comes in the form of, of, of safeguarding some of the jobs that might be used on that project and, and securing uh, organized labor for, for aspects of the project. So it's important to, again, identify those stake stakeholders early on and find a way to address their concerns. There are obviously more challenges uh, that may come up with P3s. Um, as I mentioned, there's some state legislatures that are just fundamentally opposed uh, to imposing a new toll or fee. Uh, I, I believe we've seen this in Texas to some degree. Uh, I, th I think there were some referenda in recent years um, after there were some, some failed P3 projects in that state. And the legislature, or excuse me, the referenda basically said that um, there would be, uh, that new highways would be required to be free. In other words, no new tolls could be placed on, on new highway construction. And so we're seeing a little bit of a, a shift in some of the, um, in the, some of the states and how they handle these, these projects because we have seen some failures uh, from time to time. Those failures might come when the private partner simply doesn't perform or uh, what is, what is been more commonly seen is that they go insolvent, um, and that may be a result of uh, missed projections um, or just downturns in the economy. Uh, and those downturns in the economy may trickle out and uh, result in, in changes in the usage. Uh, there may be fewer uh, travelers on the road using those toll roads, and so the, the revenue stream isn't coming into the private partner as they had expected and um, it may cause them to experience financial difficulty. Um, some other studies have been done, uh, one by the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that many of the savings are, are from uh, the lower wages and benefits paid by the private companies uh, to employees. So there is some concern um, about, about that issue, um, and that's another challenge that P3s 
uh, and the governments that, that seek to promote them uh, will have to deal with. Are there ways that, that P3s have evolved? Um, yes. Uh, one of the most uh, important ones is, is the establishment of P3 dedicated units within the government. Um, these P3 units can do a number of things. Um, some of the, the most important things that they do is, is they provide quality control. They'll help with uh, coordination throughout the procurement process. Uh, in a number of instances, they'll, they'll have uh, people that are dedicated to seeing these projects through, so there's some technical assistance that they can provide. Um, one of the other important things is that they'll provide some, uh, you know, mode of, of standardization and dissemination um, throughout the, the, the procurement process initially and then throughout the life of the, of the project and or the, uh, the contract. And they can also, these units, help to promote um, P3s and, and go out and meet with stakeholders and um, really identify the advantages of, of moving into the P3 model. Um, another uh, evolution in, the, in P3s is, is the bundling of projects. And if you recall from one of the early slides, we saw that Pennsylvania was one of those states that uh, had a, a high percentage and a high number of failing bridges. And to address that problem, um, they turned to the P3 model and they've uh, put together the Rapid Bridge Replacement Project. And uh, it, it bundles together um, the replacement of hundreds of deficient bridges around the state and tries to take advantage then of those economies of scale and the efficiencies. And then over the life of the um, project, uh, or the, the life cycle of that contract, rather, um, there's going to be some um, some efficiencies seen in the in the maintenance of those bridges as well, because there's going to be some standardization uh, with the construction. And so uh, hopefully that that gives you uh, an oversight uh, or an overview rather of um, the P3 model, some of the the benefits of it, and um, and, and some of its um, a value in, in handling infrastructure projects. And so with that, I, I, I'd either welcome some questions or turn it over to, to Paul. All right, thank you, Brad. I mean, sorry, sorry, thank you, Kevin. Our next presenter is, presenters are Brad Sugarman and Patricia Power. Brad serves as chair of Bose McKinney and Evans Environmental Law Group. He's a partner and assists clients in environmental issues, including regulatory compliance, litigation, and insurance coverage. Brad regularly appears in state and federal courts defending clients in complex litigation involving toxic tort, environmental cost recovery matters. A recovery of insurance for environmental liabilities is another important component of his practice, helping clients to offset costs of remediation. Equally important is the assistance to corporate and municipal clients to draft agreements and to conduct environmental due diligence related to commercial and real estate transactions and efforts to limit exposure to environmental liabilities. Patricia Power is an attorney with Bose McKinney and Evans and a senior vice president of the federal relations with Bose Public Affairs Group. Patty represents corporations, local and tribal governments and universities before Congress and the administration, including the Departments of Defense, Interior, Agriculture, HUD, and the Environmental Protection Agency with a focus on environmental, energy, and natural resource issues. Prior to establishing her practice, she worked for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's offices of water and Office of Legislation. She is licensed to practice in Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and graduated from American University, Washington College of Law. And I see you have the screen and may proceed, Brad and Patty. Thank you, Paul. Um, we're going to build a little bit on what Kevin had to say about following the money and in infrastructure projects by talking about um, the Trump uh, White House infrastructure plan and how, more specifically, that frees up money that was uh, previously spent or, or attempts to free up money that was previously spent through going through the uh, regulatory permitting process for infrastructure projects and makes other statutory reforms um, that could provide uh, mechanisms for uh, funding the environmental end of projects. So on February 12, 2018, the White House released its $1.5 trillion legislative outline for rebuilding infrastructure in America. We will refer to this document as the Trump Infrastructure Plan or simply the plan in our remarks today. The, the 59 page plan contains a 16 page section devoted to infrastructure permitting improvement. that sets forth multiple legislative proposals to streamline, expedite, consolidate or eliminate the environmental review and approval procedures for infrastructure projects. 
under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and other environmental statutes. The prospects for this legislative, legislative change are unclear. If the proposals were adopted and ultimately passed by Congress, the Trump Infrastructure Plan would significantly alter the legal framework for the environmental review and permitting of these projects. In discussing these, the proposed changes in the Trump Infrastructure Plan, there are a few themes that present themselves. The first theme is that the changes proposed in the Infrastructure Plan are not new. They have been underway through a number of presidential administrations. Some started in the case of CERCLA changes as far back as the Clinton White House. So the reforms proposed in the Trump plan are, by and large, the culmination or continuation of years of gradual change to the breadth and design of permitting and statutory programs. The second theme recognizes an environmental reality that Patty will address. That is, how can we remove repetitive and unnecessary costs from the environmental review and permitting of infrastructure projects and leave more on the table for completion of these projects? So with that in mind, uh, let's turn to uh, two examples of the pr proposed reforms. I actually have three examples in my materials, but for purposes of uh, keeping track on time, I'm just going to discuss uh, two of them. So the first are proposed changes to CERCLA, are the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act um, of 1980. Um, CERCLA was passed uh, by Congress in, on December 11, 19, 1980, during the Carter administration, in response to environmental hazards caused by inactive or abandoned hazardous waste sites. In broad terms, CERCLA provides the Environmental Protection Agency with the authority to clean up hazardous waste sites and then provides legal mechanisms to recover the costs of that cleanup from those entities potentially responsible for causing the contamination. CERCLA also establishes the Hazardous Substance Superfund, which is a large trust fund that was to be used by EPA in cleaning up hazardous waste sites. CERCLA created a system for determining which cleanups could be financed by, by Superfund. It did so by identifying the most contaminated hazardous waste sites in the country and placing these sites on a list of, known as the National Priorities List, or the NPL. NPL sites are the only sites that qualify for long-term cleanup action financed by the Superfund. CERCLA also imposes extraordinary liability for anybody who's ever been, been caught in the middle of CERCLA litigation. It imposes joint and several as well as strict liability on four classes of potentially responsible parties, or PRPs. And these include current owners and operators of the property, past owners and operators of the properties um, that owned the property during the time of a release of a hazardous substance, parties that arrange for disposal of hazardous substances at a site, and parties that transported that hazardous substance to the site for disposal. If a PRP meets the statutory definition of one of these categories, it is potentially responsible for the entire cost of the cleanup all by itself. That's the joint and several portion. Moreover, because this liability is retroactive, developers who purchase the property after the contaminating activities have caused have ceased can still be retroactively responsible for the cleanup cost. It is also important to note that CERCLA liability does not discriminate between private individuals, corporations, or even governmental entities. If you meet the statutory definition, then you are potentially liable. Given its broad scope of liability, it was not surprising that CERCLA had a profound chilling effect on brownfield redevelopment efforts, owing to concerns that the redevelopment of these sites might expose the property owner to potentially limitless liability. Developers were reluctant to buy these properties even at discounted prices, and risk-averse lenders were even more reluctant to fund the projects, fearing they may lose the value of their collateral due to contamination, or worse yet, uh, be stuck with the contaminated property post-foreclosure. So beginning in at, uh, at least as early as 1995, um, EPA and interested stakeholders began to negotiate limitations to surplus liability provisions. Most relevant to our discussion today is the Small Business Liability Relief and Brownfields Revitalization Act, or the Brownfields Act, that Congress passed in 2002. Among other things, this act introduced an exemption from CERCLA's broad liability scheme known as the Bona Fide Prospective Purchaser, or BFPP, exemption. Under this exemption, as long as the prospective purchaser follows the statutory requisites, which include taking reasonable steps to deal with the contamination, that purchaser will be protected from liability. The act also funded brownfield revitalization by authorizing uh, up to $200 million per year for brownfield assessment and cleanup. In doing so, it defined brownfields, quote, as real property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of, 
which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. Brownfield funding has evolved to providing funding in a variety of ways, through assessment grants, cleanup grants, revolving loan fund grants, job training grants, training research and technical assistance grants, targeted brownfield assessments, and area-wide planning pilot programs. However, uh, the Act and the amendments under the Act specifically excluded from the definition of a brownfield property that is listed on the NPL thereby making it ineligible for funding. So with that background to circle, let's turn to the infrastructure plan proposed changes to it. The first proposed change is that it expands the Brownfield program that we just discussed. It amends section 101, um, paragraph 40 to allow NPL sites to be considered as Brownfield sites and, theref and thereby make sites eligible for Brownfield grants. This change would make significant funds available to conduct environmental assessments complete cleanups and implement long-term stewardship. As proposed, this would be a new Brownfields grant program targeted to Superfund sites. Uh, changes to CERCLA also uh, proposed in the Trump plan clarify the limited liability for state and local governments. Currently, under, under the statute, state and local governments are exempt from CERCLA as long as they acquire ownership or control of contaminated property involuntarily. Uh, either through bankruptcy, tax delinquency, abandonment, or other circumstances that constitute, and this is a, a judicially interpreted term, involuntary acquisition. The plan clarifies and expands this protection to state and local governments that are acting in their sovereign function, quote unquote, to voluntarily acquire the property. The, the Trump plan also proposes uh, changes to CERCLA that would grant EPA express settlement authority. It would uh, amend the law to provide EPA with express settlement authority to enter, in, enter into administrative agreements with uh, BFPPs and other statutory protected parties, and amends the law to allow EPA to enter into administrative agreements with any party to perform remedial action. Uh, now let's turn to NEPA quickly. Uh, the second example, the National Environmental Policy Act, signed into law by President Richard Nixon on January 1st, 1970. NEPA is often referred to as the Magna Carta of the environmental movement in the United States and as our national charter for the protection of the environment. The essential purpose of NEPA is to ensure that environmental factors are given the same consideration as other factors in decision making for the federal government. And the way it goes about doing this is requiring an environmental impact statement, or EIS, which considers all the impacts and, and alternatives to those impacts uh, posed by a project. Um, for our purposes of discussion today, infrastructure projects are nearly always um, subject to the EIS requirements under NEPA. And the problem with this is that the procedure has grown so vast and complicated that the average time to move through from the notice um, of an intent to, uh, to go through the process all the way up until the, the issuance of the final environmental impact statement has grown to four years and seven months. Um, given this, it's not hard to see why the Trump plan is attempting to alter the NEPA process. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, these process improvements are not new to the Trump administration. They stretch back to the George W. Bush and Obama administration. Many of these changes find their way into the Trump plan and are, are focused on shortening the time needed for NEPA review and allowing limited work to proceed during, uh, during that NEPA review. So first off, the proposed changes are to streamline um, the EIS uh, 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 review process through regulatory reform and has a specific goal of making a NEPA decision within two years. It also, um, uh, proposes eliminating environmental impact statement review under Section 309 of the Clean Air Act. Uh, this is important because uh, it is duplicative review that is uh, must be conducted by EPA during the EIS process. Um, it also has uh, provisions in it that focus on categorical exclusions, and categor categorical exclusions are those projects um, or actions that do not need uh, an environmental impact statement are need to go through the NEPA process. They also, the, the proposed reforms um, in the Trump plan also uh, highlight uh, actions that can occur 
concurrently with, with NEPA review. For instance, acquisition of rights of way, um, the ability to incorporate transportation planning documents and decisions, um, and uh, incorporating uh, highway and transit streamlining into NEPA review. And finally, some of the, the, mo the more interesting from a litigation standpoint, um, I could come uh, to the final bullet points on, on this reforming NEPA slide, are limiting injunctive relief under, uh, under judicial review. Um, they propose uh, uh, shortening the uh, statute of limitations also to 150 days. And now I'm going to skip forward through the Clean Water Act slides and turn things over to Patty. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a good follow-up on where Brad left off and, and some of the points Kevin raised. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the broader uh, President's plan for infrastructure changes. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the first, I want to I basically want to cover the numbers and the scopes, the scope of the um, projects and where uh, we see things going. So the numbers, uh, this was a big debate for a long time on how big this was going to be, and the final number was 1.5 trillion dollars in funding and financing, and this is for over a 10-year period. Um, so 1.5 trillion dollars comes from 200 billion dollars in direct federal spending and 1.3 trillion in state and local funding, private partnerships such as the three Ps that Kevin described, and then the regulatory reform savings um, that Brad uh, touched on. Um, big question in DC is, is how do you get to $200 billion? Um, so $100 billion of the 200 is planned for infrastructure investment grants. These would be implemented by the Department of Transportation, the Corps of Engineers, and EPA, and would supplement existing programs. And that's an important point because there wasn't a lot of understanding as to whether the Trump legislative plan was to be was to replace what we now have or to supplement it. And the, it's clear now that it was in, it's all intended to supplement existing programs. Um, one of the controversial points of this part of the plan is that it would put significant increases in for local cost shares. Uh, so now where you have an 80-20 federal uh, local split, they would flip that to 80% of the cost would be borne by the local governments. $50 billion of the $200 billion is for rural projects. Um, the plan is for 80% of that to be distributed by the governors in the states and 20% to be distributed by block grants. Um, they have plans to formulate a, um, a, a calculation uh, formula based on uh, rural lane miles and population. Um, there was a lot of debate about flipping the cost share for 80% uh, local share in rural areas, and the White House heard that and um, and is not going for uh, a, a high local cost share on the rural projects. Uh, 20 billion of the 200 is for transformative projects. Uh, these will be nationally competitive grants implemented by the Department of Commerce. And I want to quote directly from the plan on how this is described as ambitious, exploratory, groundbreaking project ideas that have been significant that have significantly more risk than standard infrastructure projects, but offer a much larger reward profile. So these are the you want to think about things like commercial space travel or um, or hyperloop, like uh, Chicago is contemplating um, with the Elon Musk group. Um, $20 billion out of the $200 billion is, uh, is to improve infrastructure financing. Um, of the $20, $14 billion is for the expansion of some existing programs such as TIFIA, WIFIA, the railroad financing program, and um, Department of Agriculture uh, programs in their rural utility service. Uh, the remaining $6 billion of the $20 is to enhance the use of private activity bonds. Um, and the remaining 10 billion of the 200 billion is to fund a capital, a federal capital revolving fund uh, that would be implemented by the Department of Interior and would basically be used to support um, civilian, public, uh, federal properties. Um, moving on to the scope, um, there's a very broad scope contemplated in this program. 
Um, it's some of your standard projects that you would think of when you think of infrastructure, like transportation, so highways, bridges, transit, rail, uh, water projects, everything from wastewater, drinking water, stormwater, flood control projects, uh, navigation projects, both inland waterways and ports, um, hydropower, uh, brownfields and Superfund funding, uh, broadband, VA hospital, commercial space I mentioned, and um, and finally, um, and, and in an interesting um, and really appropriate uh, direction is they talked a lot about uh, workforce development. So improving Pell Grants, uh, career and technical education, reforming federal work study programs and licensing requirements to enable more um, more professionals and, and other people to work uh, to build these infrastructure projects that we so desperately need. So what's next? Um, so this, when this this was released in the middle of February, it kind of um, it kind of hit with a big thud in D.C. primarily because um, the administration did not identify a pay for, and there was little interest on Capitol Hill to address such a comprehensive. Uh, set of changes with no way to announce to pay for it. But it's been recognized there's a lot of good ideas in the package, and they are very likely to get picked up um, in, um, in other pieces of, of independent legislation, uh, for example, program reauthorizations that are considered on a cyclical basis. Um, the, uh, the White House did issue an executive order and then followed up with an MOU that came out in early April that, um, that outlines some of their plans to streamline the federal environmental, environmental permitting process, as Brad was discuss, discussing. Um, they can do a lot, but it, of course, is limited to what be, can be accomplished administratively, um, and there is no current um, legislative activity to amend NEPA or the ESA or any of the other underlying environmental uh, uh, statutes. Um, there is some activity, though, on, on infrastructure bills, for example, uh, the FAA reauthorization bill and the Corps of Engineers reauthorization bill are both moving and expected to be enacted by the end of the year. Um, there is also a growing interest to address the Highway Trust Fund stability, um, and even though there's a lot of political will to do that, uh, action on that is unlikely this year. And, and finally, um, sort of on the inside baseball side is is what's the White House doing about this now that they released it? And um, it's been pretty quiet, um, not the White House in general, but definitely on this issue. Um, the, the lead um, staffer on this uh, left the White House a couple of months ago, and there have been other staff um, assigned to working on this plan that have left as well. So I think they have shifted their focus onto other other issues and um, and really have sort of handed this off to Capitol Hill. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions, uh, but I'll turn it back to you, Paul. Yes, uh, thank you, Brad and Patty. Our next presenter is uh, David Wilson, who practices in the area of business and construction litigation in Texas with the law firm of Mahaffey Weber. He has tried well over 100 cases as first chair lawyer in a variety of cases. He also served as lead counsel in over 70 appellate cases, including to, to the Texas Supreme Court. Consistent with his experience, his practice includes extensive trial and appellate representation as lead counsel, primarily on behalf of the construction, manufacturing, and oil and gas industries. David has been listed as a Texas super lawyer. He is designated as AB preeminent by Martindale, as well as being inducted as a member of the American Board of Trial Advocates. David, I see you have the screen, and uh, you may proceed. Uh, as we discuss uh, infrastructure projects and as they go forward, one of the common things we'll face, uh, both as lawyers and as uh, companies who are working uh, on infrastructure projects and as uh, public-private partnerships developing uh, infrastructure projects, is the uh, issue of delay damages and delay claims. Um, Obviously, uh, delays can take many forms as construction projects uh, uh, unfold. Some are owner-created delays, uh, most typically when the owner's design professional or architect or engineer uh, delivers plans late or is slow in making decisions on uh, important design changes. Uh, there are also contractor delays. The contractor can't get a subcontractor to the job on time. Uh, the, the contractor uh, has troubles with suppliers uh, that creates delay in the project. 
Then there are concurrent delays. Those are delays that really can't be attributed to either party, either the owner or the contractor uh, or, or uh, whomever may be at fault, and that's really not taxed to uh, either side. And then, of course, there are weather delays, and depending on how those weather delays unfold, those are typically not uh, a, a cause for a, a damage claim. Um, but, but there are experts who will attribute weather claims to one side or another, depending on the circumstance. What kinds of damages uh, do we deal with when we talk about delay claims? Uh, extended inspection and administrative costs, uh, lost revenue. For example, if you have a football stadium that's a public project uh, and the team can't um, sell tickets to that stadium because it's delayed, you, you'll have a claim for lost revenue. Um, or uh, if you have uh, a facility that could be rented, such as an auditorium, uh, you may have a loss of rental value. Uh, and occasionally you may have diminished property value related to the delay. The property becomes ready and available on the market, uh, such as uh, public-private housing project. Uh, there may be diminished property values if, if the delays result in the project opening uh, at a downturn in the market. Uh, other kinds of damages would, would include the additional cost for performance, uh, paying labor to stand by and do nothing, renting equipment, carrying builder's risk insurance longer than you planned, management time, indirect costs such as the inability to uh, uh, allocate your home office overhead to different projects. Uh, obviously, uh, th these claims, because they can be substantial, when they go into a dispute are hotly contested. Uh, and record keeping is a huge factor in who prevails and who doesn't prevail uh, in the case of a delay claim. Um, arbitrators, uh, judges on the Court of Claims, jurors, tend to factor in contemporaneous documents in their decision making and not what a witness says sometimes two or three years after the events that give rise to the delay. Uh, so it's a key factor both for public owners and, and their managers and for contractors on public infrastructure projects to maintain good records. Um, one thing that is frequently contested in uh, delay claims is the Eichley formula. This is a method of calculating unabsorbed home office overhead or extended general field conditions when there are owner-created delays. Um, th this has been accepted generally in claims against the federal government in public projects. Uh, many state courts have uh, not yet evaluated whether the Eichley formula uh, for uh, an additional method of damages uh, calculating this unabsorbed home office overhead is recoverable. Uh, so as a practice tip, if you're in a state that has not yet uh, had its Supreme Court adopt and approve the Eichley formula over a Dalbert challenge, you should always make such a Dalbert challenge uh, if your uh, opposing uh, party is, has an expert using the Eichley formula. Uh, now, obviously, uh, we're talking right now about disputes. How do you, uh, and what are ways you can uh, mitigate the risk of a dispute turning into a costly piece of litigation or arbitration. Uh, one of the ways people have traditionally tried to uh, mitigate the risk of del uh, delay claims is having no damages for delay clauses in their contracts. Uh, in some states, uh, there are common law exceptions to the enforceability of no damages for delay clauses. Uh, Texas has struggled with that in particular uh, about four years ago, a little less than four years ago. Uh, a very important case for general contractors and subcontractors um, on delay came out. Uh, it, it, there was a development project in the Port of Houston uh, developed by Zachary uh, Construction. Um, and Zachary Construction uh, brought a delay claim, prevailed at the trial court to the tune of several million dollars. The Court of Appeals at the intermediate level reversed that uh, verdict and ruled for, in favor of the Port of Houston. And that, this was taken up to the Texas Supreme Court. Generally, uh, no damages for delay cla clauses are valid uh, most of the time. If you uh, have a uh, simple uh, uh, delay that's not caused by something extraordinary, um, generally in Texas, those are enforceable. Supreme Court had previously held that a contractor can agree to a, assume the risk of construction delays and not seek damages. However, 
there are there are other courts around the country and other courts uh, at the intermediate level had noted exceptions uh, when the delay is not intended or contemplated at the time that the contract was written, fraud, misrepresentation, or other bad faith, uh, or the delay has been extended for such a length of time that no one possibly could have anticipated it at the time the contract was entered. Uh, also, if you've enumerated delays in your contract clause, if the specific delay is not within that enumeration, uh, then it, the uh, clause is not enforceable. Um, also, if the delay was based on active interference, if the owner or the contractor is actively causing the delay uh, that, that the other party is suffering, that's outside the scope of enforceable, enforcing a no damages per delay clause. Generally, however, in Texas, the right to contract had been considered stronger than the above exceptions, and so draftsmen had been uh, working on creating no damages for delay clauses that were so strong that any type of delay would be accepted. Uh, the language in the Zachary and Port of Houston contract said uh, there would be no damages for delay, even if such delay or hindrance results or arises out of the negligence, breach of contract, or other fault of the Port Authority. So the Port Authority's lawyers clearly tried to accept, accept, accept and exempt any type of delay on the, the Port Authority's part from uh, being enforced, being uh, collectible. Um, the Texas Supreme Court said, uh, we're not going to enforce uh, a clause that exempts a party from tort liability and caused uh, for harm caused intentionally or recklessly. Um, the, the general concern there was that would incentivize wrongful conduct uh, and damage contractual relations. So uh, the lessons to be learned from this, because this generally uh, follows the um, majority rule around the United States, uh, the Zachary case. Number one, everyone needs to understand what you're agreeing to accept uh, at, at the outset. Uh, once you know that certain uh, costs are not going to be recoverable, you can learn to manage around that. Also, be clear in, uh, in the language that you're negotiating. Um, make sure the parties agree uh, what length of delay is tolerable, what's not tolerable. If you're a subcontractor, you should agree to receive a proportionate share of what is recovered from the owner. Uh, also, during the project, get everything in writing. In the Zachary case, uh, the, the point of dispute arose because the Port of Houston verbally promised uh, uh, not to impose liquidated damages for, for delay uh, and to uh, uh, go forward with a change in the work. Uh, and then when it, when it was time to bill for that work, they refused to sign anything to memorialize their prior promise. So it, to the extent possible, uh, it never can be said too many times, get it in writing. Uh, the, uh, another significant case that same year out of Texas that uh, impacted delay claims is the uh, Martin Eby case. Martin Eby had a substantial uh, delay claim against the Dallas Area Rapid Transit uh, Authority. Um, they joined in their delay claim the design professional, LAN-STV, uh, because the plans were considered late. Uh, LAN and STV uh, was found 45% at fault by the jury for the delays and assessed $5 million in damages. And this was under a theory of negligence and negligent misrepresentation. Uh, the Supreme Court reversed that jury verdict and said that because of the economic loss rule, uh, a general contractor can't recover uh, essentially economic damages from an owner's architect or design professional. So if you're in a state that has a broad and uh, rigorously enforced economic loss rule, as a contractor, your only defendant you can seek damages from on a delay claim is likely going to be uh, the owner, and the design professional is not going to be a part of that. Another thing that comes up in delay claims are notice provisions. Many contracts, such as the AIA 201, uh, uh, has language that says, uh, the contractor is to give notice of an event giving rise to a claim, and it has, and these contracts will have deadlines for providing that notice. And some of these deadlines are as short as seven days. Uh, some courts have enforced these notice provisions either on grounds of a failure of a condition precedent by failing to give this notice, you've, uh, you're barred from making the claim, 
or by failing to give this notice, uh, you've waived your claim. So be wary when you're negotiating uh, contracts uh, that these provisions are in there. Uh, always, if you're working on behalf of a contractor or a subcontractor, negotiate for a longer deadline. Uh, uh, also be aware that some statutes uh, make such notice provisions unenforceable. Uh, so uh, be, try to be careful to uh, at least negotiate the deadline for giving notice of an event giving rise to a delay claim uh, or any other type of claim uh, to at least within what the statute in your state calls for. Um, so the, uh, that's the uh, uh, overview, a uh, very broad overview of delay claims. They're one of the most frequently litigated uh, disputes in infrastructure projects. Uh, and uh, for example, in the Zachary versus Port of Houston case, that was uh, a claim in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so anyone involved in negotiating an infrastructure project or advising people who are in the middle of an infrastructure project needs to be familiar with some of these general principles. I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. Thank you, David. Our final presenter is Greg Bergman. Greg is a senior shareholder of Bergman, Dacey, Goldsmith in Los Angeles. Greg represents clients throughout California in the areas of eminent domain, environmental litigation, construction, complex litigation, including class actions, business and commercial litigation, insurance, real property, and other practice areas. Greg is outside counsel for the Los Angeles County's largest transportation agency as it moves forward with its multi-billion dollar transportation infrastructure improvement plan for the County of Los Angeles. In this capacity, he regularly advises and represents the agency on eminent domain matters throughout the county. And Greg, we don't have your screen yet. There you go. You have it now? Yes, we do. You may proceed. Okay. Thank you. Welcome all, and I will do the cleanup. And what we're talking about, uh, basically insurance and surety bonds to help you in terms of uh, both sides in terms of the risk because obviously many things can happen in construction that are risky and um, insurance is essential to managing the risk and losses as is the surety bond. Um, if you look at the, basically one of the ways the owner finds out how substantial the contractor subcontractors are if, if they can afford the insurance, if they get the insurance, if they get the bond. Um, usually the public entity the private entity, the owner, really wants to have an insurance coverage plan in place, what they require early and let everyone know who's bidding on the project know what is required. So they early on, you can get that and which type of insurance you want. And basically what you're looking for is the type of insurance, the minimum, deductibles, the form, the length, and always the owner, whether public entity or private, should be an additional insured because that gives the owner and the public entity or the private owner many of the rights that they want to have if there is a claim. Now, it's important for all of this is great, but if the owner does not have someone or people who are going to review the policies, going to review the language, going to review the type of insurance they're getting, review the type of the, the strength of the insurer or the surety, it won't do you much good just to have a piece of paper. So it's really important that there's somebody who actually looks at it because all types of litigation can occur wherever there's construction. Start with commercial general liability. If there's general liability against the project, uh, the owner wants to be protected from litigation because things can go wrong. So you want the appropriate general liability policy. This is not a presentation that's going to the weeds, but these is almost a checklist of the things that an owner should look at. The construction all risk policy, the car or builder's risk insurance to cover the loss or damages to work in progress on a construction project. We had here in LA a construction project going on and uh, Vagrant started a fire and burnt down the project, which also burnt the building next door to it. So these type of insurance, without them, the owner is gonna be left holding the bag 
but with it in place, the owner will be protected if the language is right. Again, I'm going to repeat that over and over. You want to make sure there's the appropriate workman's compensation employer's liability insurance. Different jurisdictions have different rules, but in California, if you don't have the appropriate or the contractors don't have the appropriate workman's compensation employer's liability insurance, the owner of the project could end up being liable for the damages to an injured worker. The damages, think about it. You have a young worker, 30 years old, with a family who can no longer work. The damages could be in multi-millions of dollars. One of the areas that was mentioned, you know, the architect might not be responsible, the engineer might not be responsible, the surveyor, designer. Th these are people or, or companies who are very important to the project because the contractor, subcontractor, was, when they're bidding, are, are quite often relying on the plans of the architect, the engineer, surveyor, et cetera. And if it's a big enough project, there should be co coverage demanded from the architect, engineer, et cetera, to have insurance that if there's a claim, the insurance has to come in and pick up the defense of that claim, both the defense of the claim and any payments that might be required. Because when projects go wrong and there are problems, there's a lot of finger pointing and a lot of parties in the lawsuit. The owner wants to let the insurance, various insurance companies for the contractor, subcontractor, architect, engineer, resolve it. Because, but the owner doesn't want to do is spend big dollars trying to resolve the various claims going back and forth. We had a case where the architect's plans, this was during major building going on about 10 years ago in California, which is happening now again right before the recession, and now again they have major building. Things are going so fast, sometimes mistakes are made, people just moving the project along, but you really have to take the step back to get the right insurance in place to make sure that the owner is protected. Project assets, uh, as happened here, uh, a transient started a fire in a major project. It wasn't just the building that went up in flames, but a lot of the assets, the equipment, et cetera, which is very expensive. Uh, we're doing a lot of tunneling in, in LA with the Metro. And those, those, that machine is as big as any building and is incredibly expensive. If this equipment gets damaged, first of all, it should be in the contract who has responsibility to protect it, et cetera. But project asset if the, if the assets are going to be large enough and expensive enough, you want some type of project asset insurance. And you want that will cover it and deal with the problem. And if you have a project that you want to keep moving, and let's say some assets alone are either damaged or destroyed, that the insurance company will provide for replacement relatively quickly. Transportation. Why are we raising all these issues? Because in real life, all these things happen. Uh, recently here in California, on one of our freeways, a uh, large carrier with many large uh, tr equipment on it, uh, a car cut in front of a car in front of it. They could not stop in time. There was a major accident. Uh, luckily, no one was killed, but the equipment on top of the transportation uh, vehicle were all thrown off. So who's responsible to pick it up? Who's responsible to fix it? Who's responsible to replace it? These are the type of things that need to be looked at on a major project because these things do happen every day and it only matters when it happens that you have the right insurance. Another, again, an all risk insurance during operation that deals with damage during operations because things will occur and damage might occur to third parties. Third parties might claim the construction project damaged us, damaged our economic, economically, damaged us physically, something needs to be done. These are, this is almost a checklist of insurance to look at to decide what do we need on this project, what is it going to cost, and then business decisions can be made. But they should be made up front, not later. But again, it's important that you get the right language in the policy and you get from an insurer that will actually be able to cover. And if it's large enough to make sure there's reinsurance to protect the owner. Mechanical electrical failure insurance, these things happen. Again, you know, this is not intended to have a horror story of list, but there are mechanical electric failures that occur and other insurance might not cover these issues. Therefore, 
is this something that matters to the owner and does the owner need to have this type of insurance? Again, who's ever in charge of insurance and risk analysis for the owner should take a look, decide which of these insurances they need, what language they need, and then move forward and make sure they require the right carrier. And this should be in the bid documents early on so a contractor, subcontractor can't say, hey, you're changing the ground rules. I didn't bid on this. Put it in so they can bid on and include the cost for this type of insurance. Automobile liability, do you want anybody driving any cars, any vehicles involved with your project where there's not an automobile liability insurance? It speaks for itself. Now, directors and officers liability insurance. This really goes to the private entities. You know, your directors and officers may get sued for various acts or omissions during the project, and it could be big, big dollars. If you have an officers and liabilities insurance policy and you have a good track record that it shouldn't be that expensive, it will help cover the cost because the cost of litigation could be massive in these large projects and you might want the indemnity. Remember, if, the if everyone has the right insurance, the insurance companies together can work out or should work out a plan to keep the project going and pay where necessary. Political risk insurance, it depends where you are, where, whether you need it or not. Pollution insurance, as most people know by now, in the old days, the old policies covered pollution. Uh, the new policies tend not to cover them at all. So therefore, if you're working in an area where there might be uh, pollution issues, groundwater issues, uh, chemical issues, et cetera, you might want to look at a policy that covers pollution because what can happen, pollution can be in the ground and no, there's no issue. However, once construction starts and the various federal and state agencies come to look to see what needs to be done, if anything, regarding phase one, phase two inspections, you might end up having a major pollution cleanup which can result in incredible costs. Also, which happens sometimes when there's trenching and another work, uh, workers have been killed and injured from pollution that was in the ground that wasn't properly known about. And therefore, the pollution insurance, if properly drafted, will cover that. Delay and startup for business in interruption. You know, when the, policy, when the contract says go, and then there are delays, uh, who's going to be responsible for that? You know, look at this, get the right language, look to see if this is something you need in your policy. We had a couple here in LA where they opened up ground, discovered these utility vaults 100 years old that no one knew about. Totally stopped the project. Became a major issue in terms of who's going to be responsible for the delay. These are things to consider depending where your construction projects will occur. Okay, one of the things that should be considered along with insurance is a surety bond because that's going to talk about the mitigation. Now, we're not going to get into indemnification agreements, but a fair indemnification, indemnification agreement is going to put the burden on the right party, whether the owner, the contractor, subcontractor, backed up by insurance, who's going to be responsible if something goes wrong, someone's hurt, the, something occurs that interferes with the project or a third party claim. Surety bond, and we're running we're a little over time, so I'm going to make it quick. The surety bond is really something that protects everyone. Two things. You want to get a surety bond that covers the project. You also want a performance bond and a payment bond. And we can go into details at another time, but there's various, there's, there's construction surety bonds, there's performance, there's payment bonds. One, Look at the form. It's what's called a short form, which gives very little value to the owner, and the long form, which gives great value to the owner. But it also has to be a surety company that has the proper assets to cover the situation. Now, various states have various requirements for public projects in terms of uh, public work contract, surety bonds, and performance bonds, etc., and bonds. But not bonds are not always required for architects, engineers, and surveyors, but depending on the project, you might require one. And the nice thing about getting a surety bond is it gives the owner more protection. It's also a great in-depth pre-qualification process that you require the bonds up front and the right the type of bonds you want. Can the contractor 
subcontractor, et cetera, can they get the bond that you need? That's a great way to help eliminate a lot of problems and a lot of weak contractors. Now, you have to balance what you're looking for and you have to be fair. But on the larger projects, without even private or public, well, public, you must have them, but it's a bond that actually gives real coverage. Someone needs to put it out what you're looking for and then someone has to read it to make sure you're getting that kind of coverage. The economic security for subcontractors and suppliers is great because the, if there's a non-payment, because whatever occurs to the contractor or even the owner, the payment bonds protects the subcontractors and suppliers, and, and it's also a great tool to get the best subcontractors, suppliers, and contractors to bid on your project because that's really what the owner is looking for. You, you want to get the best people to bid and the best coverage. So the, the, the project can go forward without the worries what happens if it goes wrong, and then how do you keep it moving when something does go wrong? So with that stated, um, the right insurance, the right surety bonds, if you think about it up front, what you're looking for, and using this as a template, what do we need, and then determining how much it's going to cost and what language you want, and who's going to review it to make sure you get the right bonds and insurance up front, not after when you have a problem, best way to protect the project. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Greg. And I'd also like to thank you for attending our webinar. If you're interested, our presenters will provide copies of their PowerPoints. If you want one, please uh, email me or any of our presenters. Uh, if you have any comments, suggestions, or requests for topics to be addressed in future webinars, please also email me. And thank you for coming.